we turn our attention to what might be called the libertarian left, or more popularly, anarchism. This is the same logic shared by Marx and Freud. Functioning libertarian socialist institutions, I think they are an interesting model that uh, I think is highly relevant. Yes. Hello. Welcome to another episode of theory <laughs> This is a very special episode today because today we're talking about, it's soon to be released, but we got the copy a little bit earlier. What day is it going to release, Jen? I think officially in the 21st of April, but I think it's circulating already. We're talking about the queer art of history, queer kinship after fascism, and we're talking about the book with the book's author, Jennifer V. Evans. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Can we have a little intro to yourself? Sure. So I am, it's always fun, right? When, when you're asked to sort of self-define, it's always really interesting how we position ourselves. So, I mean, I am, I suppose I'm a cultural historian of Germany, increasingly doing work on sort of transnational themes. So I guess I look at 20th century uh, Europe, but I also am now increasingly rooted in the 21st century, which always sounds kind of strange, right? I am speaking to you both from the uh, traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people, and that really very much informs how I see my work, you know, in in a place like Canada that is, you know, uh, a site of ongoing genocide. So as a historian of Germany, as a historian of queer trans world making and living where I do, you know, this all seeps into the kind of work that I do, how I write and how I think about my own position vis-a-vis the past and my responsibility to maybe write history differently on a whole host of levels. So yeah, that's, that's how I define my sort of disciplinary rootedness, I guess you'd say. Awesome. Thank you. Paolo, do you want to say anything before we head head on into the episode? Yeah. So I was forcing Hannah. I was like, hey, this book is about to come out. I'm really interested. I have read your work. And also we are sort of in the same sphere of studies. So it was one of those like, oh, I follow you on Twitter. You're taking out a book. What a great opportunity to finally speak. <laughs> that's not a conference. That's not just like this academic bubble that we both work in but uh, just to discuss the work and to discuss the book and I'm really excited for you to be here. Well I'm so happy that you asked I mean I I actually followed along from like the first episode of your of your podcast and I was curious I was like what is this and uh, you know it's like theory meets podcast you know that's an awesome thing there's giggling and laughter that's also a good thing so uh, I was really I was really pleased to be asked to come come on and uh, and chat about the book. So yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. I will also preface this by saying if you don't know what queer is, before this episode, we have an introduction to queer and queer theory. So if you want a little introduction before going into this episode, because we're we're all very familiar with queerness and queer theory and queer history in this podcast so we might get a bit lost in the language I guess (laughs) we'll try and uh, preface everything but I just wanted to point that out give a little shout out to a previous episode we also talk about we've talked about queer a lot this season (laughs) yeah accidentally we did epistemology of the closet queer under failure yeah so it accidentally went from like oh we're gonna do a general thing on theory to being oh let's talk about the things you've already read which is predominantly queer theory (laughs) and you did the episode on camp which you know always comes to my mind when I think about you know all of these things so uh that might have been my first that might have been my gateway podcast actually it could be how could I forget Susan Sontag (laughs) that episode is so much fun (laughs) Yeah, and I think this episode is also going to be quite fun to do as well, because before we hit record, we were getting into this. I'm really excited to be talking about kinship. It's something that throughout the text that we have read before for this podcast, it's kind of skirted around the thought of kinship, but this book obviously concentrates and looks really into the historical aspects of kinship and how we can reflect back and see a way forward with that. Uh, If you want to give us a short intro to your book, please. 
<laughs> yeah, sure. No, um, I'm so happy to talk about all aspects of the book. And um, I suppose it's kind of a curious entity because on the one hand, it's a history and it's also meant to be an intervention, right? It's meant to be very deliberately an intervention in queer theory, bringing the historical to queer theory, I guess. So it's a little bit of the best of both worlds, we hope. And it takes the kind of example of post-1945 Germany as a launching off point for how to think about kinships old and new, how to think about citation and self-referentiality and allyship with the past. So it's it's meant to do work on a couple of different levels uh, at the same time that it's kind of not doing the history of queer and trans lives, you know, with a focus on social movements exclusively or sexology exclusively. So in that way, it's also trying to do a different kind of work. And that's kind of why the title is maybe a little weird, The Queer Art of History. It's meant to suggest that we can do history differently and there's great merits in doing it so. And, uh, and maybe kinship is, is a way forward. I think it's also really interesting that with the title Queer Art, it also implies that uh, cultural historian, because before it used to just be like a focus of, oh, we're going to give the exact narratives of what was happening in the past. And it's like, no, that's sort of, it's important to try and be accurate, but also look into how all these things go together and not just the diaries, the letters, the ephemera, but actually feeling, touching, sensing as much as possible with that ephemera. And it's also why I really enjoyed reading through and trying to find the sensation through these stories and giving not just a voice, but a more transformative uh, vision of that voice. Yeah. And subjectivity is such a huge part of it, right? I mean, I'm definitely interested and I've, I've written about this before about how we are all very present in the the work that we do, we either acknowledge that and make that part of the story, or we very deliberately kind of close that door and then concentrate on some sort of objective, you know, approach to the past, which we all know is quite a claim, right? So yeah, for my for my work, it is very much about how I'm an interloper in all of this. And uh, I'm a conduit for readers, but I'm also creating meaning in the way that I set up the analysis itself. And and so, yeah, it's very much about trying to recognize and be very explicit about the fact that we are positioned in relationship to the past. And that's not something to be afraid of, but that actually is enriching and exciting as long as we kind of develop tools for thinking about it, you know, mindfully. So yeah, I'm absolutely trying to give that to the reader that that there's some great merit and excitement about thinking along those lines. It's also interesting to think about this kind of presentness that you're talking about. You know, we're present not only in our work, but that our history, I guess, becomes present to us as well. You know, this idea that we'll kind of touch on it at the end as well, but this idea that we are using history to make connections and commentary on today. And I really enjoyed that about your work, the way it's very clearly connected to today in ways that I don't see some historical work doing. And I I really enjoy that because I've always kind of championed history that is presently informed, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. It wasn't as obvious to me even at the time of writing, right? I mean, if you imagine that I probably submitted the manuscript well, maybe even 18 months ago. And so there is like that kind of gap between then and even now. But it was clear to me even then that, you know, that we were entering into a a place where so much of what we were writing about was being either weaponized or manipulated to serve certain ends. And so I was very aware that we were living through a particular moment and uh, you know, not just a moment of culture wars for sure, but a moment where it's not just the far right that is doing the nefarious work, but that increasingly those ideas are seeping into the mainstream and being taken up by a whole host of folks who probably never thought of themselves as spouting far right talking points. You know, the fact that sort of We've seen a manifestation of anti-wokeness among even leftist and progressives. And, you know, that wasn't really a language that was circulating as much 18 months ago, but it's just very clear to me even now 
that, you know, my book in a way is responding to this idea that, you know, to look at intersectionality is somehow woke and that intersectionality and critical race theory and queer theory is somehow political in a way that you know, it shouldn't be, it, it's uh, artificial, it's it's woke. And so my book is trying to say, no, there are great merits in doing this work. And in fact, uh, when we look to the past, there is so much evidence of kinship, of alliances and solidarities across difference. So it's not some fabrication as part of a woke politics, but it's actually the historical record that we've just sort of forgotten, you know, existed. And so here's an attempt to bring it back in a way that shows that it's exciting and interesting and and maybe a guide, a way forward, right? No, exactly. And what I found very fascinating is connecting sort of to Halberstam, just also seeing the failures within the progressive. While we try to strive for the best, it would be ignorant to just not focus as well on the failures within these movements and the failures within progress and only seeing the very nice highlights of queer history is taking away the right to our history because it'd be hard to accept the good and the bad and the ugly. Yeah, for sure. Especially when you think about who is now often making change for, for the majority, right? I mean, it's it's about folks who who often have, you know, believed that they've done the heavy lifting and that they are now in a place where, you know, they've realized the change and the, you know, then then suddenly it's interesting that the change is suddenly bounded for certain people and not others, but they but they don't recognize that this is a pattern and that they're actually reproducing hierarchies instead of opening doors. And so it is it is so important, right? At the same time it's also important to recognize that the story of queer and trans life Life in, and I, you know, I'm speaking about Germany, but it, there, there are sort of universal takeaways. Um, is not solely just doom, gloom, sadness, but there's also joy and uh, desire and lust and all of the good things that somehow have also fallen off the table when we do the very important work of focusing on. The, you know the bad, and there's a lot of bad. But what about those other examples of of the good that that don't always find their way into our into our histories? So I'm trying to encourage us to bring those back as well. Yeah, it's always, uh, even with the bad, there's always been people seeking joy and beauty within these periods, especially after the war, where it's sort of Germany rebuilding itself then dismantling and rebuilding again, and just trying to find pure joy, even if it's like small, and just how it just becomes even larger because it is so it's it's just trying to seek that bit of light in something that's dark Mm -hmm. for sure and even if that joy is transgressive and maybe not to our palate you know is another part of the 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 story right it it, it's so hard when you're writing because you're, you're very aware that with each sentence you want nuance and you want specificity but and then when you reproduce it in a like a micro microcosm it always ends up sounding you know a little half baked but yeah, to recognize too that that quest for joy or desire was not necessarily value free, and maybe not even something that we can appreciate or want to appreciate even in our in our own sphere. And so, just to sort of recognize that 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 exists, and it's not something we have to be afraid of. We can actually write about it, think about it, be critical of it, but that it absolutely has to be part of the narrative instead of sort of swept away as being undesirable or a waste of time or not important. I think you also do well of holding up these kind of contradictions, you know, like there's joy, but it's not it might not necessarily be the joy that we recognize as joy that would be acceptable to us, I guess. Because one of the things I find in my own research is there's all these contradictory stories and contradictory voices. And if you focus on a particular type of queer history and you almost like risk erasing these other voices and this other, and you know, like even I was talking about it before we started, but the way you breathe life into this history is just so wonderful even even while you point out these contradictions you know like we're not going to be particularly focusing on it today but in the chapter one when you're talking about Elizabeth Hartung who is Ellie for short so even when you're talking about Ellie and talking about how she was a 
Nazi party member since 1939 and personal friend with the NS Women's League chairwoman. But then she also ran this like very queer bar. And I think that's just so, it's so interesting. Like you get, when you tell history like this, it brings the history to life. In all their complexity, right? And the, the cool thing about the uh, the Ellie story is that you know, the way that the story also becomes known to us, and I'm not the first to write about her at all. I mean, she's she first surfaced in Jens Dobler's work on post-45 Berlin, and he was, at the time, he was an activist scholar, then he became the archivist at the Schwulis Museum, and now he's uh, working at the Police Museum in Berlin. So he first wrote about it as part of one of these community archive volumes, and then I ended up looking at the same material. And I think, um, who else? She's surfaced in a couple of different places, which is also an interesting story, right? That she is so interesting that she's uh, she's a touchstone, really, for post-45 queer Berlin. I know that she's going to surface in Andrea Rotman's awesome and forthcoming book on Berlin as well, coming out with the University of Toronto Press. So uh, there are some of these characters that are, you know, fascinating in terms of just their own place in history, but they're also kind of iconic in the way that they have surfaced in our work. And I think that's interesting in and of itself, right? Because on the one hand, it shows that she's fascinating in her own terms for, yeah, being beyond words, not easy to describe. Where do you place her? Where do you locate her? She's complicated. And then you see that folks have kind of tapped into certain aspects of her story for certain different reasons, right? And that's then part of this life of uh, the archive and how it also changes over time, which is something I find really interesting. I do a little bit with that and with the images about the social lives of some of these characters or some of these images. So I, I find that extremely interesting, for sure. Yeah, I just, I'm fresh from um, a couple archive trips where I went to local archives here that are very small, decently funded. <laughs> and uh, I'm flipping through people's photo albums for the chapter I'm writing right now. Um, it was this German POW camp up in uh, Lancashire. And children were making these really cute drawings of the soldiers and handing it through the fence. You know, this is a very complicated history, but it is those moments where it's just like, it is the innocent of the child, the soldier taking that in, and then someone wanting to have this memory. There is a reason why these things are still in circulation. And it's not just to put it up in a book to collect dust. It is these instances that want to be remembered and want to live on despite whatever else was happening. And, it, you know, especially when you when we talk about like history, we tend to give like a very overarching narrative and we kind of forget the humanity with all of this. It, it wants more the good, the bad, the ugly and the stuff that is sort of in that gray and the gray is what's fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I like I appreciate that you say that. I mean, I am very interested in in trying thinking a lot about how we write, you know, like, so we, we have words, and we have, we have language at our disposal, right? And we can either just sort of willy nilly throw the words on the page and just get the info out and chart change over time. First, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. But you know, why not actually play around with language? Why not put language to work to do certain things in terms of our relationship to our reader, right? Why not think a little bit about how you want your audience to encounter some of these people? And, and what work can you do to sort of structure that in encounter. So I, I loved, I, I benefited a lot in all my work, the earlier book as well, on um, sort of storytelling, thinking about the work, the, the writing that we do as itself, more than just a tool or an instrument, but that, it, that it's part of the creating atmosphere, setting the stage, you know, trying to negotiate emotions that are also emblematic of the time in which they were Created. So yeah, you know, why not actually think a little bit more about uh, what we're doing as an art, right? As uh, as not just a social science, uh, but as actually an art form in and of itself. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's a nice way to also introduce language that is used in your book. Uh, before we were <laughs> record, we were talking about how certain words in this book are translated in a way that is very direct. Whereas in German, the word transsexual and transvestite, the words that 
in our current English speaking academic world tend to be very careful around, but the inclusion of these words is one, just the translation. We have to acknowledge that because it's said in German and German's a very gendered language as is Spanish and French and all these other languages. Those things don't translate well to English, but that it doesn't take away the fact that they're being used either to be inclusive or exclusive. I really enjoy that, the, the keeping of that. And if someone wants to know more about why that specific word was used, it is not out of shame. It's just this was the word, this was the language that was available. Yeah. And in some cases, it's the language that people use to refer to themselves. So I try to do that in the text too, right? Where I'll say something like her word her description, their phrasing, because it, it signals to your reader that this is not just something you're you're throwing around without thinking. You're actually trying to sort of, you're either trying to honor the archive and the, the language that it used or just the, the frame of reference that a person had at the time, right? So yeah, it's, uh, it is tricky. And you're absolutely right, like different audiences. And it goes both ways, right? Like, so, you know, for a, an Anglo-North American audience reading transsexual is tricky. And, you know, it, it, I mean, it's, it's fraud, it's political, it's all of these things. Reading queer from a German perspective, and increasingly maybe a British perspective, depending on who you talk to, right? I mean, the way that queer as a term is under siege right now, uh, where in Germany, there are those who say that queer, much like race, are American ideas, that they come from the American Academy, and therefore they are suspicious and they're woke. So, you know, it, it does kind of cut in multiple directions. But I think what's interesting about it is just that it really reflects our times, right? So when you when you linger on them, and you, you put them under the microscope, you see that that's a a historically rooted response to a term and that, you know, in five years, 10 years, we'll have other, you know, associations with, with the term. It's why trans asterisk was so useful as a, as a way of trying to get at, to really signal that this term as an identity claim is tricky and problematic, whereas trans asterisk is really useful because it allows us to do the work of looking at gender nonconformity in a much more broad kind of way. And, it's nice, too, because Jack Halberstam, who was one of the first to sort of um, put it in print, is very taken, like his work is very taken up in Germany. So it actually is one of those bridges to the sort of German context that, that works relatively well. So I think also worth talking about, I guess, in relation to language, but also in relation to the source material that you're drawing from is issues around language still happen if you look at like older histories and when you're thinking about queer histories as well these issues around language constantly come up <laughs> but I think it's more I guess pronounced when you look at a more modern time period when you can find more information over how people identified and sometimes contradictory information you know there's been many times where I've looked for references of a certain person and they've referred to themselves as like she, her, or as a woman. And then I've looked at a different source and they've re referred to themselves as he, him. And I'm like, okay, so which one do you go with as a historian? And, and how do you tell those stories in a way that's coherent as well? Because you could also go she, him, or yeah, you can also do that, but how do you make that make sense? But then the thing I kind of wanted to say about source material. So you have a really interesting quote where you talk about modern history, I guess, and it's on page nine. But the quote is, unlike medievalists and early modernists whose liturgical epistolary uh, literary and iconographic texts have nudged them to think about sex for the ways it affects a number of knowledge relations. Modernists seem almost persuaded by the belief that queer past is somehow fully discernible, a product of modern forms of categorization and display. I think this is interesting because you you have source material that could pre-produce today. You know, you have things like photographs. We take photographs all the time, you know what I mean? It seems like a simple source to figure out but actually when you go deeper into it that's not the case and um Paula's research is a, a good example of this yeah I like to give the quick TLDR so I work with amateur photography so a lot of these photos have been removed of their original contacts people go in through photo albums take out what they want sell it or it can be something that was 
source from field stripping, which is when someone passes away on the battlefield, you go through their clothes and you take whatever's on them. And these photographs end up everywhere. So my archives are global at this point. So with my research, a lot of these photographs have been in the past used to justify very hateful rhetoric, specifically last summer, so 2022, the Tagesspiegel used one of the photographs that I researched to write anti-trans columns. And, you know, it's taking away and using these things that don't have their original contacts and being given a whole new life in a way that is creating an alternative history. And that is also the danger within queer history itself. I'm not a fan of people going, we're going to queer the medieval. It's just like, no. (laughs) Because queerness or LGBTQ plus would have looked very differently. You can't just apply these things. You need the context. So with my work, from the start, I go, I'm trying my best with the information that I have. I'm also a Puerto Rican woman from the States. (laughs) So I'm looking at these things in a very different lens. And I'm using art historical knowledge. I'm using knowledge of the camera operation and putting all these things together to push forward my findings and potential readings of what is in front of us. So this is a long-winded way of saying that photographs can have a life of their own. And a photograph is read like a book. It's not just a picture. There is an intent. There is the subject. There's the person holding the camera, pushing that button. And then later, especially if it's film, they process that photo. They go through a stage where they take out the film. They clean it. They they blow it up. They cut it down. I find it especially illuminating in the second chapter where you talk about the differences in the published photograph in a magazine versus the original negative. These things, like images are a form of documentation, but also their interpretation is another form of documentation. It's so true. I mean, that that example was one of those eye-opening moments where I realized that I, I had built, and you know, it's not to say that it was nefarious, but I had built an entire argument around a particular reading of a photograph that was a reproduction. Right, this is what Paula is saying. And uh, when I had the chance to look at the actual negative, you know, I had made an argument that this, it's one of the rent boy photos of, of Herbert Tobias. I had made an argument, or at least in my mind, I had thought what I was seeing was you know, a a kid who was maybe high, maybe, you know, messed up. And this allowed me to think about him as maybe debauched or desperate, precarious, living on the fringes. And then when I actually looked at the negative, I realized that it was just a a flaw in the reproduction. And in fact, there was crystal clarity in his eyes. And it just, what it, it doesn't mean for me that that's the truth of that image, but it means that it had me realize that the sources themselves in their various states really do push for a certain kind of interpretation. And once we become aware of that, um, and this is again, where I'm not willing to say that the one was more truthful than the other. The one was truthful within the context, within its framing. The other one was truthful in terms of what I saw in the negative. And then the real interest is sort of what I was bringing to those images or what those images pushed me to think about. And that's that was what, for me, was a real eye-opener because it gets us to think about our sources as agentic, right, as having an agency over us and, and what we interpret into them. And so that's that's always been super interesting for me. I was thinking about it as you were talking about the Fritz Kitzing photos are a great example to speak to both, you know, Hannah and, and Paula, your points about how challenging it is dealing with historical figures, sources, uh, especially around the question of identity, right? And the Fritz Kitzing photo is a really great one, and also an image that's been circulated in various different ways and interpreted in various different ways by colleagues and by friends. And, you know, the, the story is it's a photo of, uh, of a cross-dressing person who's who's arrested by the Gestapo for prostitution. And that's part of the weirdness of the story is that they end up being arrested for female prostitution, dressed as a woman, 
but it's clear that the Gestapo sees them as as a transvestite. And so it's just about how they apply the law, which doesn't make any sense. But they take a bunch of photos of Kitzing where they they force them to dress a certain way. And then they take that as evidence of their transgression. And I, I write this up by saying, well, when we pay attention to the way that the case file works, we have to listen for the fact that Kitzing seems to be telling us that he's a he who dresses as a woman. And so that is his preferred presentation. So when we when we assume that Kitzing is a they and not a he, we're denying Kitzing's own agency in saying this is how I want to be interpreted, right? Or at least we're we're not recognizing the power of Kitzing's own framing. And and so I try to sort of I don't want to say I play around with it, but I try to make explicit that when we view these folks in a certain way, we are making a set of claims and they often reflect where we sit in our own moment. And they don't always have to do with how Kitzing (laughs) viewed the world. And so just to make that explicit, that when we call someone they or he or she, you know, there is a power relationship in terms of the interpretation. And so it's, uh, it's more than what we might believe we're just seeing. It's not just transparent knowledge. It's actually a reflection of sort of where we find ourselves, where we find ourselves today. And some of the very important battles that we're waging over visibility and, and seeing, in this case, maybe the trans past, but the, uh, not necessarily, I'm trying to argue, not necessarily, uh, it shouldn't come at the expense of how perhaps a historical actor is actually trying to nudge us to see them in the archive as well right yeah and I think that also hints upon like the consent aspect of photographs something that I'm going to be working on later this year is consent within photography and the usage of photography to continue the perpetuation of bullying and hazing and especially with those photos that you just described it is be someone being forced to take these photos So it's also the misuse of photography within history where we would reproduce these photos, especially um, there has been a rethinking of photography within like hate crimes in the United States. Some of them were published for the purposes of shock and consent from the family to be produced. But there's also photography that was taken against the will of people and photography of corpses that cannot consent to be photographed that is then being redistributed. And obviously, these are more extreme examples of this sort of situation, but it's also how we use photography within our work. We have to think about the consent of the individual that's also being depicted. And I thought it was really interesting how you also talked about like the willing sitter for the photograph and allowing the photographer to go ahead. And obviously what happens before and after that instantaneous click we don't really know. It could be written down, but how much do we know about this? And I felt it was really important to have that ambiguity within your text. It was introduced in the introduction, but then it was also somewhat explored as well in that second chapter, especially given the ages of the people depicted. Yeah, and that's what I I find that so interesting because it's not, and I mean, it ends up sounding sort of uh, Lucy goosey and it's not meant to be. It's just to say when we view these images, these are images of rent boys that this particular photographer picked up on the street uh, in Charlottenburg and uh, brought back to his his apartment. And he had one of those in Germany, right? They have one of those um, those like what do we call them? Backyard sort of garden spots within you know the industrial sort of tenement housing. And, uh, and he would bring them there and, and all manner of things are imaginable, what, what went on. And then he would photograph them. And some of these boys are young. One in particular is extremely young. And I try to say, obviously, when we view these, there's a power relationship that we have to take into effect, right? But at the same time, there's so much more going on with these images. And we have to actually acknowledge all of the things and not just land on the one. Because to just say that these are images of sexual abuse, you know, belies the fact that Tobias himself was a target of an aggressive state. And so he's, if you want to use the language of perpetrator, I don't, I don't use it with him, but you know, he's not a simple uh, actor. He is, you know, multifaceted. He's also 
someone who whose art but also whose existence was sort of denied by subsequent generations of the gay rights movement because they saw his work as whether it was too transgressive or whether it was uh, not political, not overtly political enough. And so there's more to the story of these images than just seeing them as symbols of aggression or examples of sexual violence. There's just so much more that we need to do with images to like you said, right, to restore the humanity of the sitting subject and also the person, Tobias, who, you know, enters into that relationship with them. And I guess I'm just trying to sort of show that to the reader, that there's merit in keeping things messy, as opposed to making neat and tidy interventions that maybe foreclose other, you know, other possible layers of interpretation. I think this work can be applied in a really interesting interdisciplinary way that maybe perhaps people wouldn't approach the work and like seeking that out, I guess. So I use a method. So I'm based in sociology now. I've moved away from the historians. But I um, use a method called photo voice, which is essentially where you get your participants to take photographs of whatever you ask them to take photographs. And it was used to replace a visual method where it was just the researcher taking photographs of things that they see around then interpreting those. So you then take the photographs that the participants took and you interview them on the basis of the photographs. So I use this in my own research for, and it's not really been used like this-ish. I I was a bit experimental, but um, you get the participants to, well, I got them to go on queer tours within museums or go around exhibitions and take pictures of things that they felt they identified with to understand the relationship between the participant and the what they're seeing, the representation and the history. And I think it's also interesting to, it made me rethink, because I've been writing my methods as well <laughs> this past month, and it made me rethink a lot of the ways I was approaching the photographs because I was approaching them in a sociological sense on the basis of a lot of what the photo voice people say and then I was like actually there's a deeper level here you know one of the ethical I guess ethical power relation issues that I identified is um, I got participants to take photographs with their own devices which is a usual thing within this method but some of them were better at taking photographs than others. And so you find yourself, and I imagine this is the case in in historical images as well, you find yourself leaning towards the most aesthetic images or the images that tell the stories that you want to tell, I guess. <laughs> and so you almost have to either resist or acknowledge that urge within yourself to lean towards certain source material. So I think that's interesting, yeah. I've never heard of photo voice, so I've just written it down so I can go and take a look. But yeah, that's that's great. I love the idea of uh, letting them be the uh, the guide or the the lens through which you you know you you all sort of interpret the the material. That's that's awesome. Yeah, this is where I'm gonna be a little bit on the opposite because I think it's because I did the art historical training for so long. I'm actually attracted to the really messy bad photos. So in my work, there's a couple photos where there's obviously like some sort of like party happening, and the photos are blurred. There's people's fingers in the way, or like it's obviously whoever was photographing was very intoxicated, and you get like the feet. Or it's really close up because they're using the camera as an extension of themselves in a way. And you go into like Lacanian and I've been even hitting up some like old Krakauer (laughs) theory around all this stuff. But there's also like a beauty within the bad photo because it's not working aesthetically, but it's trying to say something in a way that is just, you know wild a current photo that I actually had to ask my supervisor to help me read because uh it was this party had taken place it was an Easter party and the subject is covered in his own vomit just like you know and then someone wrote on the photograph in a really bad handwriting and I'm like I can't see it but I didn't just want to send my supervisor this horrible photo so I had to like crop it and she's like no no no, let me see the rest I'm like I'll show you later (laughs) but it's it's there is I think initially we will be interested you are interested in the aesthetics but the more you sit with the photograph the more you want to see where it's messed up like how did this come out and also 
once more going back and seeing the entire film strip, seeing why this one was chosen over all of the other ones, which I'm sure you're also doing with, you know, what we select to show people. I think this is kind of where your work comes in, Jen, because your work is asking or almost like pointing the reader towards like looking deeper like when when Paula's saying the mess you know some of my photographs I tried to ask my participants to avoid taking pictures of other people who weren't on the photo voice study <laughs> but I've also got really beautiful photographs where people have took pictures and then they're reflected in the image and then there's a, one of my favorite photographs somebody's took a selfie and it's like slightly blurred but they took the selfie with the jar of Sappho because they want to almost create this heritage with this object and, and what they're seeing. So I I think I need to look deeper into the the photographs themselves. It's interesting as well because in my research I, I get to speak to the subjects directly and I guess that's what this history is kind of missing, right? I ask the participants what their perception is. But even some of it like... The- <laughs> There's an object with a very prominent erection, let's say that. <laughs> and one of my participants took a picture of it. And I, I went through, so my initial plan was to go through every single photograph and ask them, you know, what, what, why did you take this? He was like, I just thought this was funny. <laughs> And so you also have those moments where, like, I don't know, people find real joy in the history they're seeing. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, it's true. I mean, and the, I mean, a lot of my stuff is fine or semi professional photography, right? So it it does. I, and I'm not looking at the masses of, of a person's corpus. Instead, I'm looking sort of at the ones that have become quasi iconic. So there is, there is sort of like a story to why those images versus others, right? But it is always interesting when you put them in the context of everything else, and then ask the question of why certain ones stand out to you even, right? Or to your participants and, uh, and yeah, and, and, and how sometimes the answer can be just, you know, I liked this big ginormous erection um, for all the wrong reasons. And so, you know, that's the story, right? That's interesting that this person felt that they, they were disarmed enough by you and that they felt happy and to share this really silly kind of funny moment, right? And I mean, that's the story, right? That's the interesting thing or the, you know, the fact that Paola felt she had, you know, had to crop this image and that like, so what is that saying about your relationship to this subject? And yeah, no, I just, I just like the self-awareness, right? Just so that we have that self-awareness that we're making that part of the analysis as opposed to seeing that as sort of the precursor to the analysis that, you know, no, we have a relationship with our sources, with these people, and that that in and of itself is time bound, time specific, and can be in some instances really interesting to pursue. Like the fact that the the Manfred photo, I have a funny story about the Manfred photo that is in the chapter that you all read. So it starts with that image, right, of like, here's how I encountered Manfred. And there's so many interesting things about that passage. I first wrote it up as part of this um, American Historical Review article, which is in North America, right? It's like the premier history journal. It's really hard to get into. And it's considered a big feather in your cap and all of this. And when I first submitted that article for review, it gets five peer reviewers. So it's reviewed. You don't have a reader one and a reader two. You have reader one, two, three, four, five. So that's intense. And um, when I got the feedback, there was one, one of the readers, reader four, thought I was a man. Because obviously, to write about this, I had to be a dude. So that was interesting. So they were the whole time talking about me, the dude, writing about Manfred. So there was an interesting something, something going on there. Then another one had said that because I had analyzed it with, you know, in first person, I encountered Manfred, that that was cultural studies and not history. So that was interesting, right? That, That sort of tells us about sort of where history was in whatever it was, 2012, that that was considered so outlandish. But then what's even funnier is that when it got into the (laughs) HR, I sent a copy to my friend Matt, the person that I described, that we first saw it when we went to the Berlin Gallery together. And then I make some quip, I don't know if it's in the book, I forget, where I said something about how this image of Manfred, they've sold little postcards. This image of Manfred, I said something like in the article, was featured on my friend Matt's on a, a cork board outside of his loo. And I said something cheeky like, you know, where his pickups encounter Manfred anew. And Matt was like, um, 
<laughs> I don't really have that many pickups and they don't really see the photo, but it's a cute image, you know, nice, nice try kind of thing. Like I see, I see where you were going, but my life is not nearly as exciting as you just portrayed it to be. Right. So, I mean, it was kind of a funny example of me sort of being very creative and then, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of a, there's an argument for, for pushing back a little bit with that. But more interesting was the fact that the journal, you know, the readers for the journal saw something very distinct in just the act of writing this story. Oh, and there's other one other thing that's kind of neat about that iteration of the Manfred story from before is that when it did get published, I actually got emails from sort of queer men of a certain generation who wrote me to thank me for actually, well, putting these in their words, beautiful pictures in the AHR, but then also validating a history of desire in that kind of space. So this gets back to Hannah's point about, you know, when is something transgressive and when does it become sort of normalized? But recognizing that in this instance, right, or even the fact that it's now in a book, on the one hand, it gives it a certain sort of normative gloss, but it's still transgressive for certain people, certain generations who see that as like a massive sea change of an approach to to images of queer desire, right? Surfacing in a place in a place like that. So it's a funny, it was a funny story. So I read I reread Heather Love's Feeling Backwards a little while ago. And it reminded me of this notion, and it connects to your own work with regards to kinship. But Heather Love talks about like not not to leave this kind of negative queer history in the past like we need all kinds of queer history to be I guess more politically productive in the now at least that's how I understand her work and it's been a while (laughs) but it reminds me of your work because I found that you you are not just finding instances of kinship in the past and also your own kinship. When you were talking about Manfred and the conference and all these relationships that you have, even in your um, acknowledgements for the book, there's so many people acknowledge, right? It made me um, think about writing my own PhD acknowledgement <laughs> and how many people there's going to be in there. But um, the, you're not only doing this uh, kinship in the past and the kinship in the now, but you're also, it almost feels like you're reaching back into the past to find kinship with people right you I remember speaking to somebody I don't want to shout them out just because <laughs> this was not part of a talk they just like told this to me but they were saying they covered like this really kind of controversial queer figure and they were speaking about actually I think if he was alive today we'd be friends you know <laughs> because even though he's this controversial person there's bits about this history that I like and I latch onto and I find interesting but then I think there's also this do you know that saying that's like oh we need to learn lessons from history or we need to you almost don't want to do that and you almost don't want to I guess because gay and lesbian history was all about finding us in the past you almost don't want to do that either but you can't help it (laughs) when you're writing histories of people these are very real people they led real lives they have interests they have their own existences and especially when you're talking about kinship I guess it's even more complicated but yeah (laughs) yeah no I mean I mean it's it's so true and I I think one of the reasons why I really like kinship as a category versus identity and here's where I am sort of you know betraying my maybe generational position it's it's that I, I really do think that there are reasons why people mobilize identity claims, and I completely understand those reasons. But I, I suppose what I find that's troubling about identity as a category is that it's it always seems to be very bounded, and it seems to be when it's used, it, it, it we we sometimes deny the sort of normativizing sort of power of an identity claim that to say you know we're arguing from this position means that inherently, right? We're denying certain other positions. And kinship is nice because it actually speaks to relationality. It speaks to our actors, many different solidarities, affinities, friendships, friendships of different sorts. And and so I just find it really nicely malleable. At the same time, I mean, it draws, you know, both sort of indigenous feminism and also black feminism, right? And this the need for thinking about kinship, the urgency of thinking about kinship as a an act against erasure. And so the my book is really trying to, you know, show the intense power 
of kinship over identity because it really allows us to speak to all what Kim Talbert calls all my relations. And it's not just about the friendships and erotic and, and intellectual you know, affinities that we have or our figures have you know, to themselves, among themselves, but it's also always recognizing in Talbert's estimation very real and entrenched power relations. And so for Talbert, it's always about the relationship right, of settlers or indigenous folks to the land. And when I use kinship, I'm also trying to, you know, pay homage to those those um, arguments about how positionality is fraught and it is political. And we are very much a part of that, that story. We can't deny our own positionality within kinships. And so I, I am really trying to suggest this is a really productive generative category because it forces us to pay attention to these kinds of power dynamics that work when we reproduce the stories of others, especially when those aren't our stories. And, you know, when we do history, they are rarely our stories, right? Those people no longer exist oftentimes. So we're always working across difference, regardless of who we sleep with and how we identify, right? So just to always make very explicit that there are uh, power relations inherent in all of this work, but that that doesn't have to mean we can't do it or that we can't do it in a generous way that pays honor and respect to who those people were as full personalities, you know, for better, for worse, you know, difficult or, uh, or easy to imagine. So that's where kinship, I think, does a really, you know, productive kind of work that, that identity, I think, is less well suited to work. Yeah, and also presents like a relationship between who we write about and it's continuing that kinship, giving those people like we, we just recorded, oh God, bell hugs, but like expressing love even to those that we don't agree with, but it's showing kinship through giving them the appropriate respect and voice that they deserve to have and why they occupy the space in your pages. It's like, no, there's a purpose for why you're here. And yeah, like I think to to round uh, back to, I think that's the importance of using the word I, because it is taking it, it is like, no, I'm extending this kinship. This, this is about kinship, and I'm extending the kinship. <laughs> the acknowledgments are another one of those examples where I'm trying to very deliberately in the way that I set it up, I'm trying to sort of show in a microcosm what the book is doing. The acknowledgments are not just sort of any old hodgepodge of, you know, thanks, thanks, whatever. It's actually a sort of an, ex- an example, an exercise in the larger argument that I, that I try to make in the book, all the way down to the land acknowledgement, which is probably something that strikes some folks as strange, but is very much at the center of how many, not all, uh, Canadian scholars sort of are encouraged to think about our, you know, to be make explicit our relationship to the systems of power that allow me to work and allow me to thrive and allow me to have the time to write a a book when others have to struggle just to make their their ends meet. So it's it's really and in fact the whole book feels a little bit like uh like that uh, homage to all of the folks that really did help make this happen. I'm really hopeful that when people read it that they see the fact that it was in a way a, a bit of a labor of love. Like I felt when I when I finished it and I submitted it, I felt. I mean, you, you're always nervous because you're like, oh, you're exposed. <laughs> this is this is who you are. But I also w- hoped that people would see that it was very much about sort of yeah honoring those friendships, those those relationships, those intellectual you know uh, affective emotions that that really drove the bread and butter you know, analysis of these archival materials, that they were essential to that work. So I hope that people would see it as sort of like a token of that affection. Yeah. The other thing I kind of wanted to say, I think what's also interesting is you, I guess, hold yourself accountable is the right word, but you also like position yourself in relation to your previous work and then reevaluate it through a new lens, which I think is really interesting because you're also um connecting it you know we spoke a little before the episode started recording where you were saying you have also tried to very clearly articulate who has shaped your thinking where why and I think that's also interesting when you think about it in relation to kinship and the connections you make so yeah 
Yeah, there's a great example that I could share with you about that to concretize it. And it's that, um, so Jin Harita Warren is just, you know, so fantabulous, so incredible. And uh, I remember when I first met them at a conference, I, I went to a round table and it was a really weird round table where there were things said that were clearly unsettling to folks on the round table and folks in the room. And so it was a very odd odd round table. And they were speaking to their book uh, that had just come out, um, Queer Lovers and Hateful Others. And so I was totally fangirl because I love this book. And so I went up to them at the end and I just said, oh, I love your work. It's so amazing. And I, we, we talked and I said, I, I've just written something on the memorial. And um, they said, oh, I'd love to see it. And so I sent it to them. And it was this earlier version of the article in which I had absolutely no clue about this whole other layer um, around the kissins and the Islamophobia. And I didn't have any of that in this earlier version. And I sent this to them thinking like, here's this, here's what I wrote. And I, we can have this kind of conversation going forward. And they, they didn't really write back, uh, for a while. And I think I had to sort of write a second email and I kind of got the sense that, you know, to them, perhaps this was just some very narrow, very manicured, very not terribly political reading of this very fraught, very difficult space. And I remember they had published something about it and they cited my, they cited my chapter and they did it in a way that was really magnanimous. They emphasized one part of it that, you know, lent itself to their argument. But I always felt like I sort of let down the team, right? And uh, so it was really important for me to revisit the chapter in the book and really sort of show how life-changing, how transformative Jin's work was in that rethinking, because that was a, an act of sort of personal growth, you know, intellectual growth. That was an awakening to seeing complexities and seeing race in a way that I hadn't seen it before. And so I wanted to really offer that up as um, part of the work that we do, right, of, of working again in kinship with other scholars whose work is, is just so powerful and also uh, recognizing that our own relationship to the past changes as we read and encounter other people's work. So I have no idea, you know, when I, I put a dedication in the acknowledgments to say that Jin, you know, Jin's work has been huge, hugely impactful. And I don't know if they'll, I don't know if they'll see it. I don't know if they'll stumble upon it, but it's just very, you know, it's, it's very much about this idea of not being afraid of revising how we encounter the past and those frames that we operate within, you know, in say 2010 versus 2015 versus 2023. And that, that we shouldn't be afraid of sort of self-revision and self-reflection. Yeah, and that goes into like the larger argument on like monuments. And uh, I had seen the specific monument in the Tear Garden, and I remember I first encountered it in 2019. So <laughs> before the pandemic, I was just, and it was very quick. It was like a stop in and go because I was with my UCL class. So we had like a limited amount of time in Germany, period. So, you know, we ran up to it, and I remember seeing it, and I was like, this isn't a big deal <laughs> because at the time I hadn't put together all the history as well. And the immediate thing that struck me was like, oh, this looks like the Peter Eisenman memorial, but it's lacking the entire memorial, <laughs> the Peter Eisenman. And if, uh, if a listener, you haven't been there, I suggest looking it up. Or if you are lucky enough, actually visit it. It was a more experimental type of monument in which has a bunch of uh, plates uh, you can go in, you can touch it, you can feel it. There's usually, I like going in the summer because children are running around it and you can hear echoes. It's a very overwhelming piece in both good and bad ways. Uh, bad because if, you know, if you have uh, mobility issues, this is not a very great space to enter since it hasn't really been taken care of that well. But also it is unstable cobblestone. It's supposed to make you trip. It's supposed to make you uncomfortable. It, it is... It, if you're able to experience it, experience it. But it was done with that purpose. And it was done in the mid 90s, or it was commissioned in the mid 90s. Yeah, so it was like many, many years of arguments <laughs> about land and costs and all that very interesting thing. And then a couple years later, 
you get unveiled the tear garden and people immediately go, oh, these are very similar. And then a larger argument comes in where I found it to be really illuminating was the fact that it was just two men kissing video and the arguments around like male presence in memorializing something that is LGBTQ plus and it's only focusing on the G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the funny part of that story is uh, is that you've got the artists, these two Danish lovers, longtime collaborators, making these arguments that, well, you know, yes, it's just two men, two boys, young men, but it's an expression of beauty. It's it's meant, again, to evoke some of this sort of past gay ar- iconographies that were, you know, that were, were marginalized and are remain marginalized within the context of homophobia. So there's this sense that it's sort of abstract beauty, which, you know, maybe an artist would, uh, you know, make that kind of claim. Uh, and then at the same time, then there's a weird twist where they say something about how, well, these are youthful you know, young men. And so it's almost like not quite nubile, but, you know, they're saying it's almost like gendered in the sense that it's about sort of an alternative masculinity. So they're making some sort of gender critique, which is fascinating. Um, And then you have, you know, a couple of folks who, who it turns out viewed from the perspective of today, take very difficult positions vis-a-vis sort of queer and trans communities and at the time, we're arguing for, you know, lesbian inclusion. Um, and some of these same folks like Alice Schwarzer are, you know, quite anti-trans now. So, I mean, they're making arguments at the time that women are being erased from this monument. And uh, and they were right. But then the interesting part is that uh, once we do actually see the video inside the monument amended so that it's a wider vision of um, LGBT life, I argue that the repercussion is a is a video that or a film that you know sort of takes the the sex out of things, sort of takes the transgression out of the the monument, and it becomes sort of like a, I'm okay, you're okay, you know, love is love is love, where we lose the sort of erotic charge that the original film really did have, which is off putting and makes like challenges people to sort of say, oh, I'm all for this memorial, but you know, do they really have to do that? I mean, which is has a power, I, I think, that is is lost from the um from the sort of I'm okay, you're okay version. So then it raises all these interesting questions about is it art, is it is it is it commemoration? Does it is it should it be an unsettling or should it be a reinforcement of where we are today and, and all of these kinds of questions. Yeah, it, it really questions also who was this meant for? Yeah, like because the purpose of the original memorial, which I, obviously you mentioned in your chapter, the purpose of the Eisenman one is a very different purpose than the one in the Tear Garden. Eisenman purposely made this one to be enjoyed by children and adults. It is meant to be a space where people can have lunch uh, on top of the thing. You can climb up on it. Uh, and I did. It was fun. Uh, <laughs> so God knows if I'm in one of those photos. But this space was not meant for that. This was supposed to be a space to make you uncomfortable. And while there is a lot of really great points that were made by people, it yeah, it does strip away the purpose of that memorial, that it was meant to invoke these feelings and not lose its force. It was supposed to be a lasting memorial. And now you know, it debuted, people talked about it, and it just teetered down. It's kind of, it's interesting, because one of the things we talked about before the podcast um, was that, you know, how do these memorials, what is the, what is the afterlife of these memorials, right? And I was just thinking when you were saying this, Paula, I was thinking about how the gay memorial is interesting in all sorts of ways in in and of itself. But for me, it's almost more interesting, or it has more power when it is the target of graffiti and uh, and hate crimes, because it's broken, and there are ways in which you see that the um, the glass that's recessed in it, you know, you'll see like police tape sometimes across it, or that kind of a uh, you know um, you know caution tape because it's being replaced. And and for me, it almost has more power in those moments because it's a constant reminder that this is still a this is still a life under siege for a lot of people. And so it's kind of funny that. It, it just raises the sole interesting question about the original design of a, of a monument, right? It's meant to serve, meant to do a certain kind of work, and then how it's being interpreted and interacted with actually gives it sometimes more power, more poignancy than, uh, than its original, originary state, right? So 
for me, I, I, you know, I don't like seeing it's, it's vandalized, obviously, but I think it ends up having more, more power in those, those moments when it's, uh, when it challenges our sense that, you know, we've, uh, we've arrived. Also, it can be going into more art historical. It, it's a it's a thing that you have to take care of. Then it doesn't become a thing that just this happened. Okay, let's move on. But if it's something that is in constant need of maintenance, of you know, does it need batteries? <laughs> I don't know how that thing runs, but it means that the community has to come together and take care of it, either financially paying for someone to replace the glass or cleaning up. A memorial works like a gravestone where you lay flowers on it, but it becomes much larger than just the individual's memory. It becomes a continuation. So obviously with vandalism throughout Berlin, it's still a lot of these things are still occurring, escalating in the year of our Lord 2023. And I think it's a really that I think that's a really fascinating point that like, it's still in the zeitgeist, we're still talking about this, even if its original intent was not the final product. Uh, with the placard that's in front of it, right? Like with the plaque, it kind of suggests that the work was done, right? I mean, I, I say this in the book where, you know, there's such triumphalism in that plaque that says, you know, we've learned from the past, unlike, you know, places in the world where a kiss is still, you know, is still dangerous. And it's like, well, a kiss is still dangerous in parts of Berlin. And a kiss is still dangerous among straight white Germans who are equally as capable of being homophobic as those folks that come from away, which is the implication on the plaque, right? So there's like, there's ways in which the uh, memorial sort of almost seem to sort of communicate the, we've done the work and we've processed our past, our dark past. And so here we are, an emblem for the future uh, without sort of recognizing that, you know, the house isn't all totally in order at home, right? Still. This is an act in process, a work in progress. Yeah, I think this is one of the issues when it comes to memorializing or creating a monument or including queer history in a museum. This kind of comes from a question I was asked at a conference a few years back where somebody asked me when you put queer stuff into or put queer into a museum, does it end up um, losing its radical edge and I think there's something really interesting about this tension I guess between wanting to have this radical edge right you you want this radical edge because you want again people to be talking about it you want you want it to be constantly in progress you know if we go back to queers or one of its original meanings about being this flexible fluid thing Essentially, you you want it to already always be in progress because then we can have conversations that, I guess, trouble fixed notions of things, right? Uh, an example I always bring up is the pulling down of the Edward Colston statue during the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, the statue in Bristol. And it's really interesting because what led to that point was people trying to just change the plaque so it, it acknowledged the history of slavery and, and all this kind of stuff and it just wasn't happening. So you end up with this really impactful boiling point that brings this conversation about history and the way we're holding up uh, certain people in a problematic way, I guess. Uh, in the old group I used to run Queer Disrupt, we had a conference called Mainstream and Queerness, the New Queer Vanguard. And the whole point of the conference was to think about the ways in which queer was being mainstreamed. And we had Jack Halberstam and Heather Love as keynotes. And Heather Love does this really interesting talk, which relates to her book Underdogs, I believe it's called, about queer deviants and queer deviant studies. But she says, maybe this isn't the time for queer disruption. Maybe this is time for like queer stability. And I always think about that when, if you're thinking about, you know, 
queer history and, and these queer histories haven't been told before how do you tell them in ways that still is provocative or potentially radical but still make them available for people who potentially haven't seen these queer histories heard these stories I also find it interesting you know like a history like the kind that you're telling Jen or the kind that you're you're telling Paula I doubt these histories would be put into museums in complicated ways right the the complexity of the story is almost too much to tell in a little 300 word 200 word plaque that's by an object i also (laughs) just to ramble on just a tiny bit more one of the things i found in my research so one of the studies i did was at the british museum and i looked at their desire love identity tour and One of the things we found was the tour almost made clear what was missing from the museum in general. So like, for example, one, a lot of my participants brought up, there was barely any queer women spoken about. And then if you look at the rooms we were in, you know, one of the rooms has all these different um, glass cases and one of them says things like sports and homeware and and stuff like this and then there's a case that says women and then it's uh, of the Roman period I believe and it's talking about what classical women in this period would have been doing they would have been at home they would have been cooking cleaning blah 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 And then in the case, they have a jar with Sappho on it, which makes no sense to the claims they're trying to make. And so almost when you place queer inside a museum, it ends up taking this radical edge anyway. It makes clear the contradictions that are in place in the museum. And so you do have these moments. It's it's very complicated I guess I think it's interesting to think about how do you deal with both wanting radical queerness that you know especially in spaces where queer people are still under attack you know the Schwuller's Museum was shot again right you know these attacks haven't ended so you do still need these radical conversations but then how do you tell these conversations (laughs) Yeah, it's funny because uh, that you mentioned the Schwulis Museum. So I'm I'm part of something. I guess it's like an advisory board. So they call it the Circle of Friends. <laughs> it's deliberately meant to be different than your typical kind of like stuffy advisory board. And we meet I don't know twice a semester maybe to talk about some of these these things. And we are, we have no power. We're just there to to chat about some of the issues that they're staring down. And one of the things that they brought to us to chat about was that they are thinking about a permanent exhibit. They don't have one. So they're thinking about creating a permanent exhibit. And what would that look like? And I, I argued against a permanent exhibit, <laughs> because I actually think that there's a non-normative power in not having something that is considered the takeaway, you know, story. And and because the permanent exhibit would end up being the social movement story, right? And 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 just how that would be that would bound queer and trans history in a particular way, right? That would plot it out in a particular way. And I argued that by having a series of small scaled revolving exhibitions, they're constantly maintaining that uh that radical sort of thrust and that it's evolving, it's changing, much in the same way that, right, queer life is is evolving and changing or queer practices are disruptive. And so I, I made that argument. Of course, the reality, the real politique is that it takes a lot of resources to mount those exhibitions. They have to work with community and not everybody is um not everybody gets along all the time. You know, people come in wanting stability because there is a power in stability, a didactic power, a community power in stability in these difficult times. So it's just a really interesting example. And that's just within a queer space. You know, the other other great example would be the uh, the exhibition that they shared with the Deutsches Historisches Museum um, on homosexuality, right? Where I talk about the image of castles as the poster for that exhibition, which on the one hand is like amazing. Here's this trans athlete with incredible definition. I'm totally jealous, you know, but at the same time, you know, it's an embodiment of a certain racialized, very white muscularity. And so there's a certain normativizing uh, impulse there, right? And I make an argument in the book that that this is useful because it forces us to, you can't help but see it, right? So you you hopefully 
linger over that and try to pull it apart. But, you know, what does it mean? Like you say, what does it mean to have to center queerness? And then what is lost as well as gained in, in doing so? Whose stories become centered? I, I, I made the argument that one of the exhibitions that I thought was super amazing that might serve as a, an alternative to a permanent exhibit was the uh, the 100 emotions, the, the Hundert Affect one, where they had um, material culture from their collection and they, you know, they staged the different items. So they'd have like a dress or they'd have shoes or they'd have, you know, different things. And they, the, each little piece was then talked about in terms of the affect that it represented. And then that was historicized a little bit, you know, these were this particular queen's shoes that performed at this bar, or this was the toilet, you know, from such and such, you know, public toilet that represented this part of the scene. And there was a really interesting way that you couldn't move through that space in the same way twice, you know, it it kind of was open ended, it represented a whole range of emotional experiences within, you know, queer trans lives. So I kind of thought that might have been something of a answer to to how to resolve this tension. But then again, there is that explicit desire and need to narrate the story. And that story often becomes, you know, from shame to pride or from repression to justice. And so that social movement narrative, as important as it is, ends up becoming the dominant one. And, and then the question is, what's what's left out. Yeah, and then it's also like the focus on excellence. So I I really liked that you were talking about Lori Malhoff's work with Magnus Hirschfeld and how Hirschfeld has been used a lot (laughs) and specifically in Germany to advertise this very like, we were so progressive back in the day. And now we're going back and looking like this person was a very complicated person. And while the work that they did with the Sexuality Institute is groundbreaking, there was still issues there. And when you reduce this history and these stories and these accounts to its bare bones, you lose track of that original narrative that these things are constantly in flux and always looking back on itself. So permanent collection just pr- makes it once more, it adds that monumentality, that permeance, that, like, and then everything was fine. And that's not what these works are supposed to do. So in a way, the constant attack <laughs> of these structures, it forces us to reflect back on why they're there, why they're still being under attack. It, it doesn't leave things in the past. It makes it front line and center. Um, I was at the Schwulers Museum last year, and I found it very fascinating, the use of GDR photography. A friend of mine who we did the podcast with her a couple <laughs> weeks ago, she also works on GDR photography, and we were walking around the space, and it was buildings that I remembered seeing, because we did like a little small tour, and it was looking at the photos of these like queer spaces and what they were used for, and then what I found very nice was someone had had a playlist that lived in that building and you could listen to the music that they were listening to and it was you know that nice old like 80s punk (laughs) but it, it made you go back to a point where it's just like oh this is just about being queer being gay but it's also like yeah they also enjoyed really random ass music um, it recenters it makes it go back to the now and i'm glad that the schwulers museum is never really a permanent collection it's a constant flux and it makes sure that one stories are told and they continue to be told yeah although who knows because they do feel that there's something in terms of legitimacy too right that to be a legitimate cultural institution means to have a permanent exhibit or the fact that you know many members of the community do want to see that social justice, social uh, movement narrative as the defining narrative, and so there is a lot of they. I mean, as any museum does, there's a lot of pressure that comes from different communities, whether that's veterans for a, a military museum, whether that's government that has a certain vision of what they want to achieve. But it's just interesting that the Schmooze Museum is sort of going through that process right now of sort of what would it mean to center certain stories over others, and what does it mean in terms of their own evolution from a community space to now a legitimate space that gets actual funding and that, you know, has a place within the 
memorial landscape of Berlin. So it's also about their kind of the growing pains of this institution. It's going to move space, right? It's going to undergo even more changes in terms of how it will feel to visitors who come to to see it for the first time. Yeah, and then how it's going to be seen by others, it, having it there. Uh, when I went, it was still, they were still changing the, <laughs> the exhibition. So I came in a, in a time where things were being moved about. What I can truly take away was just like the older men just sitting down, having a coffee, just pointing at things and like talking around. It's just like, oh, this is a way the space is being used. It's not just showing, but it's also integrating. It's a space of memory and the continuation of memories and memory doesn't have to be uh, I'm so sad or I'm so happy it can just be a coffee yeah but how that could also be alienating to some folks right like when you walk in and and I mean there have been you know trans folks who've just said that you know we don't feel welcome whatsoever in this space we walk in and it's men of a certain generation who really don't see us as part of their struggle and and we're not reflected in the exhibitions and um, or in the collections because it it's all based on who donates what and and so there is this way in which the space is also deeply fraught and uh, and exclusionary at the same time that it is meant to be there for for everyone so like any space it's a front line for all of these conversations the nice thing is that it doesn't shy away the the folks at the helm they don't shy away from these challenging conversations they you know they see them as essential to moving forward in whatever in whatever shape they do in the end right so one of the things that was interesting and i think if we jump to this and then go back to thinking about receptions of memorialization for um thinking again i thought it was really interesting that you brought up homo nationalism explicitly within your discussion. Essentially, homonationalism is this idea that LGBTQ plus rights are weaponized by Western nations in order to other other spaces that are not seen as accepting of LGBTQ plus rights. Jasbir Puar was the person who coined homonationalism and specifically uses it to talk about Islamophobia, but it can be used in, in other contexts. But it's interesting to think about how, when you were talking about the Schwaller's Museum and this idea of funding, like why certain memorials getting put in place or why and how museums are funded, you know. But in my own work in 2017, there were celebrations. Yeah, it was celebrations in the UK for the 50th anniversary of the partial decriminalization of homosexuality. So you get these funds pouring into cultural institutions such as libraries and museums and I think there was some school stuff in there maybe but you get this money poured in to serve a certain purpose of saying we are progressive we are this and it's interesting that some of those actually I say some an amount of those (laughs) representations went away after 2017 it's also interesting to think about I guess in line with homo nationalism, one of the things that I, and you were kind of speaking to it uh, when you were talking about the Schwaller's Museum about trans people not feeling accepted in that space. I think it's interesting to think about how museums represent intersectionally, I guess. It's not the best way of describing it because I don't like it to be a tick box exercise. It's not saying like, we have this many trans people represented. We, th- yeah, it becomes a mess. But essentially, like, there's a lot of instances of a queer person being represented or a historical queerness represented. So Alice Power writes this article that puts it in a way better example than I do <laughs> about an artist called Gluck who they saw in an exhibition and Gluck was represented as a lesbian woman, and then they saw in another exhibition, Gluck was represented as a trans man. And both of these things can be true, right? When we're when we're reading representations from the present day, and especially like when you have to put words to representations that a general public will understand, you also have things like that. But you get this instance of like, this group of people don't fit within this exhibition because they don't fit these tick boxes, or we're saving this representation for a later exhibition on X, Y, and Z. So you get these issues of like complex representation, I guess. And I don't know if you can speak more towards my messy 
rambles. <laughs> Yeah, no, what it what it makes me think about is that they're um, like the Schwulis Museum is such a, an amazing space in so many ways, and their collection is just ever growing. And you know they provide such an important service, but there are these gaps, and it's been fun to see sort of how different folks have tried to rectify some of these gaps, and there have been surprising sort of ways. So uh, one would be the uh, there was this article on what the the two activist scholars wrote was an act of unboxing. So these are two scholars. These two folks say that the Schmulis Museum is mostly gay, a little bit lesbian, and that's basically it. And all of their collections sort of represent this as well. You know, what are we supposed to do when we're interested in trans representation? And they said, well, maybe we need to unbox. We need to rethink the existing collection in a new way. And so what they did is they provide this really interesting example of unboxing the collection and looking for gender nonconformity or even third paths, right? Sort of transing the the Schwulis Museum archive to take sort of Jen Mannion's and, and maybe a little Susan Stryker uh, and apply it to this archival collection. So it's this really great way that they were showing that it's not necessarily about, you know, going over and shaking down a bunch of trans folks to donate their archives, but it's about repurposing, rethinking, reading against the grain, existing collections in new ways. So I think that's a really creative way out of the conundrum. And then I was thinking about something else that you were saying. Another great example of sort of intersectionality and things that don't always work in the way that you'd expect is in my book, I even talk about Yasko Fifaus, who does this film on a photographer, Jürgen Baldiga. And Yasko is a racialized filmmaker and theater maker. And he is super interested in this figure of Jürgen Baldiga, this uh, white West German photographer who took photos of himself as he was suffering from AIDS. And Baldiga is interesting in all sorts of ways. That's a massive photographic collection that they have. It's interesting for this sort of archive of suffering through AIDS, but Baldiga also was a twinta. He participated in the sissy scene, right? The sort of drag scene, whatever you want to call it in Berlin, which is a very interesting and different kind of thing than, say, RuPaul's Drag Race. It's a very different sort of vision of cross-dressing. But, you know, what's fascinating is that uh, Yasko is not going to the archive in search of himself, right? Instead, he falls in love with this, you know, this sort of uh, homonormative photographer who is, you know, uh, it's an example of intersectional kinship, you know, is what I'm trying to say. You know, it's not about going to the archive and looking for a reflection of yourself. Um, it's the fact that there are surprises and that there are discoveries and, and that we're not all interested in, you know, I don't study what, you know, French Canadian habitant 18th century settlers. I study queer Berlin, right? We're always on some level working across difference and that there is a great power to, to doing that and to not assume that everybody is always in search of precisely who they are in the archive and and just to try to find methods for maybe doing things a little bit differently in order to you know repurpose existing collections or give a voice you know a new a new voice to an existing corpus of work so that's one way around this sort of homo nationalist very singular celebratory sort of narrative that we often see serving a particular purpose Alongside that, it's also it's such a it's a privilege to be homo nationalist because it is spreading all these ideas and sentiments while ignoring that in these countries there's also homosexuals, <laughs> there's also trans people. So you're not only excluding these visions of people, but also just kind of redoing the attack. Like you are regurgitating the exclusion and almost so yeah it, that was it's a very short point but it, it's what I thought of when when you were speaking a thing I also wanted to talk about I guess when we're talking about homo nationalism and queer representation I guess is the space creating a representation for an audience but audiences also bring their own exactly what you were saying earlier with photographs uh, audiences bring their own perceptions to a representation or a memorial or a memorialization. And there's a, it's kind of old now. I say old, 2017, that wasn't that old ago. But there's an archive? 
question mark a project by an artist called Shahak uh, Shapira that is called Yolocaust. And if our audience have not heard of this, it was a project, a very controversial project, which basically combined selfies from the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin with like pictures from the Holocaust, essentially, like really graphic pictures. So just forewarning, if you go looking for these pictures, they are quite graphic. And I found the email. If you wanted your selfie to be like removed from this project, because the selfies weren't taken with consent, they were done provocatively, I guess. Um, you had to email the artist at undouche.me at yolocost.de. So you had to email this thing and ask to be removed, which is... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just reading the tags of this article and the tags are disrespectful, holocaust, photoshop, project, satire, shame, which is a lot. But yeah, essentially, it's interesting to see almost this policing, and I'm not the first to say this as many people have said it, but this policing of what people are allowed to do with memorializations. You know, this artist took offense i guess at the way people were taking pictures around this memorial right so i thought that'd be an interesting starting point for a conversation (laughs) yeah i mean it's so fascinating right because it's just deliberately policing how people are meant to interact with history and how they're meant to emote right it's a it's so fascinating about how it's it's a commentary on stage managing how we're supposed to react a particular way, how there is really only one set of reactions that's possible. I mean, it reminds me of the uh, the cruising photos that were taken also in the Holocaust uh, Memorial and how this was a like grinder photos or whatever, that this was seen as, you know, shameless. And yet, again, coming back to, you know, Eisenman's design, I mean, maybe he didn't imagine that, you know, <laughs> queer men were going to use these as sort of their profile photo to try to snag a a hookup but it is about sort of embracing all that life represents and you know the for better for worse right and if it's uh if it's about the luxury of being alive and how that is to be celebrated even if it happens to be voiced in that space in that moment but if that is what it means to be alive right to possess a broad spectrum of reactions to our environment then surely desire you know should be a life-giving force even if it's portrayed in a way that maybe we find unsavory, right? So to see something like Holocaust really try to suggest there's only one way to remember the Holocaust, there's only one way to emote in those spaces, and then to police that with this pithy little attempt at consent, which was obviously just in neither here nor there, who's going to see themselves and, and have the wherewithal to write to remove themselves and trust that it's not going to be then part of another, you know, phase of this this project i mean it's it's un, unbelievable right yeah it's i knew that there was like a fence to people taking like photos at the memorial but i i had not seen those photos till today and it also just strips the original photo of its seriousness because a lot of these things are now being contested their reality and their happening is being ignored and by attaching someone's possibly dumb selfie, I wouldn't take a selfie there, but that's me. But placing that and putting those two things as equally heinous is irresponsible. And it is offensive to not only survivors, but their descendants. And the people that took those selfies, some of them are not the smartest of people. They probably don't know. (laughs) The education is a luxury. In the West, we are told since grade school, we are told about these histories, but someone that for some reason doesn't know the history of this thing takes a selfie there. You are equating their ignorance to a perpetuation of a crime. And, a, and to even further the perpetuation of a genocide. And then to get your image off of this, emailing the silliest of emails is also jeering 
your now newfound knowledge or experience of this space. And it's also, I think, the danger of the memorial, because at some point people are going to pass away, the memorial is going to transform. And to sort of start wrapping things up, because we have been at this for a bit, it's also the afterlives of these memorials, not just through how they're viewed, but also how they survive physically in these spaces. Where I think Eisenman's is very clever is that it doesn't show faces, it doesn't show people, there's a plaque, but it's a space that is meant to be used as a community space. It's supposed to be played with by children and for the adults that know the intensity of that space, it's meant for reflection and for enjoyment. I, uh, we were just speaking earlier, I always recommend going either uh, in the summer or the winter so you can touch it, you can feel the granite, you can feel the material. Rain is not fun, but how about it? But the photographs, how do we see them or maybe even past our own lives? How would they be seen? What's their afterlife? How does kinship move from the now forward? And how is that kinship possibly even transformed? in that method yeah if we're wrapping up then because we've been here for so long thank you jen for taking the time to chat with us today it's been really nice but i the kind of ending question we wanted to finish on where do you think we should go from here i guess kind of not only in the vein of queer history or how we discuss queer histories but also in the vein of kinship what do you think kinship can kind of do for us yeah no I think that's a great question historians are so rarely responsible for the future (laughs) which is a great luxury because that's a tough one but I, I do think I mean if there's anything that is maybe a takeaway from the book it's both a cautionary tale right to say we need to be aware that we need to nurture the existing kinships that we have we need to try towards to work towards an honest appraisal of past kinships, right? To recognize the fault lines and the struggles, but also the yeah, the moments of coming together across difference. And I guess the the takeaway is to try to recognize the need for allyship going forward and that we need everyone in the fight that we're going to be fighting, and that we have to start figuring out ways to work with and across our differences in order to do that work that is going to be so urgent and so so necessary. And so that's where I feel like kinship has that productive power to allow us to find a way to ourselves, regardless of where we begin that journey, but that we ultimately, you know, get there in the in the end. So that's sort of the the reason for kinship, I suppose, and my thinking about it. Yeah, I, I'm walking away from your book, seeing kinship, not just through queer lens, but also through community works. We are speaking earlier that I think you even commented, we were doing queer zine at this smaller bookshop, because what's happening in the world, there has been like a need for more kinship, uh, getting together, doing things that are for communication, or even just occupying a space. And Moving beyond queerness, I, I'm getting a ton of notifications from uh, I'm involved in the university colleges union here. And that is another form of kinship where it's like it's not queer, but it is going across all walks of life, across different nationalities together for a single voice. So I, I really did walk away from your book being like, OK, there's, I, need to, I need to actually actively work towards kinship. And it's something I've taken for granted the last couple of years, I feel. This idea of kinship is really necessary now. It's interesting that you said, you know, you almost, well, you you submitted it 18 months ago, and then it's somehow even more necessary than 18 months ago, right? Like, this need to connect with each other, even if there are disagreements, like, we need to treat each other as as people. I know it sounds, like, super, I don't know, (laughs) sappy, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, as sappy and as as live, laugh, love as it sounds. <laughs> it's, it's about acknowledging that there are faults. There is never going to be perfections. You know, just accept people and try to try your best to still have these kinships, even if they're surface, just to continue going forward. And identity is not going to cut it. 
like identity, you know, slicing our, ourselves up into little tiny, tiny slippers is just going to make it harder for us to do that work. Whereas I, I like to think kinship will allow us to find those affinities, those commonalities, recognizing, totally mindful of the differences. It's not to wish them away. It's to recognize them and that they sometimes will be stumbling blocks and there will be tears and there are, you know, but that it's, it's worth the work because we, it's not even worth the work. We have to do the work because what we're staring down is, is just so, so dangerous that we can't afford not to. Right. So I guess we will finish this by saying thank you so much for being here and recording for so long with us. It's been really, really lovely and really interesting. Uh, it is kind of strange to think that you know it is out in the world and people will read it <laughs> it's a weird concept to think that people will now read this and and have things and have thoughts and things to say about it so it's it's really great for me to hear what stood out for you and what maybe you know meant something for you in terms of your own work too I mean that's just really that's well that's kinship but you know that's <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of the reason we do all this stuff right but yeah, no, I'm very grateful. Thanks so much for reaching out. Yeah. And for one more time, the book is currently available um, digitally and physically. Uh, please buy through Duke University Press. And uh, if you have a local bookstore, buy it through your local bookstore. Jeff Bezos has enough money. But yeah, we'll include a link to the Duke University Press site. And yeah, thank you. And shall we say goodbye? Yeah, let's say goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much for listening to Theoryish. We really appreciate it and would love to hear your thoughts. Check out our Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter at Theoryish underscore pod for up-to-date information. And please rate, follow, and leave a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. If you're interested in finding anything we have mentioned in the episode, please check our show notes or description to find more details. You can also contact us at theoryishpodcast at gmail.com. See you next time. Goodbye.